Hi guys. So a survey was released uh, recently that indicated about 40% of Americans would uh, try to boycott Chinese products. I'm a little um, not convinced about the survey because about 17% or, or something about 15% also indicated that they wanted to boycott Mexican products, which you know makes no sense at all because there was just a new trade agreement. Mexico is one of our is one of America's neighbors. The whole thing makes no sense. Um, so anyway, skepticism aside about surveys in general, um, let's talk about why buy in America or made in America doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you want to be an empire. Um, and by the way, the joke, of course, was that the people that were responding to the survey uh, were doing so on mobile phones made in China. So how does that work? How do, how do we end up in that position? Let's, let's imagine that an empire has the same philosophy as a mafia godfather. An empire is the same system as godfather. How does that work? Once I explain it to you, the whole thing will make sense. Security, surveillance, so on. Corruption, so on. So let's back up a little bit. Uh, if you want to be an empire, you can't only make things in your country. Why? Because you want to project power. And how do you project power? Well, one easy way to do it would just be to buy people off, bribe people, just like the mafia does. Um, you know, but of course, that's a short term solution. You can't bribe entire countries. Um, and so what en usually ends up happening is you shift some of your supply chain to another country and then you go back and forth. Uh, you trade. That's always been the basis for peace and relationships is trade. And why? A lot of it is really just, you know, tr if you look at trade as an extension or, or political relationships as an extension of personal relationships, it all makes sense. A lot of what happens is not only similar to the mafia, it's, it's similar to what happened on your playground growing up. You know, you wanted something from somebody else, even if that person was your friend, chances are you would trade something uh, back and forth. Um, and of course, whoever had the most stuff was the most popular uh, if he or she let you use that Xbox, that new console, you know, the, the, the new pair of shoes, right? So all this, that's marketing, by the way, propaganda, marketing, the shoes don't necessarily have to be better, right? They just have to have an advertising campaign that makes them look better and thereby attract attention to that person. So all these things, again, come into play. But the bottom line that you have to understand is that when people say made in the UK by British, Every country goes through these sort of economic cycles by British, by American. Uh, I'm, I, I guarantee you that, that, that at some point in my lifetime, uh, we're probably going to see somewhere, somewhere in Mexico saying by Mexican. Um, you know, maybe right after I'm, you know, probably in the, in the next 45 years, it'll happen. Um, it's just a cycle that people go through. Um, and maybe, maybe not Canada because their supply chain is too closely linked to the, to the U.S., um, and so it, it, it's, it's not going to happen everywhere, um, but you can see that, you know, at some point when you, one of the downsides to having an empire is that you take on these patrons, uh, you take on these subsidiaries, these satellite countries, but in doing so, you become responsible for them. So that's where you have all that advertising. Uh, you become responsible for, you know, not just parts of their economy, but parts of their security because economy and security go together. So, you know, and, and the easiest way to, way to understand all this is that, you know, the number one thing that happens these days is that, you know, when you shift your supply chain to another country, so you say semiconductors will go to Taiwan, um, you know, outsourcing, you know, working on data servers will go to Bangalore and India. What's really happening is you're doing that because, you know, you want to, you know, create a dependency on both ways, right? Um, and so how do you do that? The number one way, the most popular way, is to create debt, is, is to say that I'm gonna shift my supply chain into, into your country, but you're gonna, you're gonna go in debt, you're gonna pay me for, so, for something. Uh, and in doing, in, me, in, in, in having me come over here and open up, opening up this Amazon plant, you know, you're also gonna to agree to having a system where I'm the one that builds your trains or I'm the one that opens up a military base so that we can facilitate protection. As protection is always a mafia sort of scenario, right? So it's just how the mafia has been very successful. So this is not something where I'm putting down the mafia. In many cases, the mafia has been more successful than governments, which is why we're in the, situ in the situation we're in today, 
where there's such an overlap between legitimate players and illegitimate players, that could not happen unless the mafia was effective. And in, in, in becoming so effective, essentially denigrating the efficacy of governments worldwide. We'll talk about that later on with the taxation and offshoring. Um, but let me try to go back because we have a lot to cover. So I shift my, uh, my supply chain, but, uh, but you're paying me back. Uh, you know, I'm in a superior position. I have more technology than you do. And you're, you're going to pay me back because I'm going to put you in debt in my currency. I'm gonna, you're going to buy a bond from me, right, so that you can, you can facilitate. You know, when I, I can't just open a factory in Bangalore or Delhi, right? There's, you know, in most cases, because of colonialism, there's not much development. The development that happened in the past was based on trying to make sure that colonial powers, European powers, would be able to extract silver, gold in India or Southeast Asia, a lot of it would be tin, rubber. Those, those back then were pretty essential items. Um, and you, know, these, you can see these things change. So when, you, when, you, when I say I'm gonna go to your country and I'm gonna, I'm, let's think of it as houses. I go to your house and I say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring my Xbox over here. I just don't feel safe doing it because you, know, you got a couple of windows over here wide open. You know, let, you're, gonna, you know, you're hiring me, I'll, I'll build a couple of bars on those windows. Or I'll install a security system, an IoT system. Um, and, you know, you, I know you don't have any money for it, but so I'm going to issue you a bomb and loan you credit at, you know, 1%, a really good interest rate. Um, this is, by the way, why expansion happens faster when the interest rates are lower, right? If I offer you the same deal at 7%, eh, maybe not. <laughs> maybe I'll try to go someplace else. Um, even if that, even if the quali quality of that product is, is less, at least I can try to get a deal for 3%, um, and so on. So what ends up happening in these scenario scenarios is that you agree your infrastructure goes up, right? Suddenly you've got better windows, you've got double double pane, better insulation. But now I've got my Xbox in there and I can, it's got data, it's got, you know, you're playing it, you're showing me what you're really doing with your time. All that data goes back to me, um, which is really valuable because I can figure out, I can spy on you, I can figure out what's going on. Then I can use that data to sell you stuff. So the other lesson, by the way, is that if you do agree to digital invasion, you wanna make sure that data any data you share, it sits on, on top of the infrastructure. In other words, in an, in an application or multiple applications uh, that only you have access to. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, and basically having all that data on a server that only you have access to. So you wanna guard that data, you know, in a way that, that that's the same way that people would, people would, would guard gold. That's exactly what it is these days. So, you know, you ask, why do I have to agree to credit from you? I can go to somebody else. Well, then you're not going to get my technology. I have better technology, right? I'm number one in science, whether, you know, I'm number one in so-and-so, right? Uh, that, of course, comes with advertising, marketing, but uh, for the most part, you know, it, it, it tends to be somewhat true. Um, and, and if I'm the one who's able to, <clears throat> you know, negotiate these deals with you and transfer that technology, thereby making, making both of us dependent on each other. But of course, if I'm the empire, if I'm the one that wants an empire, I'm the one that makes sure that you owe me money and my currency, because now whatever you do, a lot of the stuff that you're doing, you know, you're not going to pay that off for 20, 30 years. In the meantime, a portion of your work comes to me. In some cases, if I'm responsible for your security, um, and, and, and in some cases, I just have you license a lot of those products right back to me. So I have a, a, an either a formal or an informal deal where I get to use whatever innovations you come up with. And, you know, or in, in, in the sense that either you sell it to me directly, whether you have a company, you sell that to me directly, or you just make sure that you license that technology right back to me as soon as you, you make it as a deal for protection. So you can see right away why we have, you know, there's, there's an incentive to um, advertise enemies because if you're, whether you're, it's, it's really convenient because it, let's, let's take Korea. You're South Korea, you tell, you know, the United States tells you, you know, listen, we'll go over there, we'll give you the technology, but you know, listen, at the end of the day, if, if we go away, maybe China comes in, supports North Korea, and then you got, you know, all that technology is bec becomes somewhat, your safety becomes compromised. If you're China, you say the same thing in North Korea. You say, listen, you know, you know either you, it's, it's not all obviously direct. It's not anyone telling anybody else, listen, you know, <laughs> do what we say or else. But the mafia doesn't do that either, right? The mafia just says, you know, give me a percentage of your profits in exchange for protection. Or maybe, you know, some hooligans show up and throw a rock in your, through your window. We don't know. We can't do anything about that, right? 
So you can also see how empires can fund in addition to getting, they want to, you want to make sure you have your, your hand in every pot. So you want to make sure that you actually fund a lot of opposition movements, because once you fund the opposition movements, the hooligans, um, you have, again, you have control over them. You can make them go away fairly quickly if they cause too many problems. Uh, in some cases, it doesn't work out. That's where you have factions, shifts in, mili in, in the mafia, where they, where they have families that now are against each other. They try to expand, so it doesn't always work out. That's how you have war. You start funding everybody, you start doing these things. One of the, th one of the things that happens is unpredictability. Um, you know, and, and furthermore, if you are in that position where you have to pay me back, well, maybe you try to cut corners. Or, it's, or maybe you're in a position where you try to take my technology and then try to copy it. And, you know, essentially try to sell, sell whatever you want under your own name, under your own products to try to get a bigger uh, share of that pie. In other words, all this, all this trade has opportunities for deception, protection, all, you know, it's got a whole soap opera, you know, designed inherently uh, within its components. So, you've got a situation now where, you know, let, let's talk about how you can, you know, like I said, I don't, I, if you want to avoid it, so, so let's say you want to avoid this, this scenario, uh, and I've obviously simplified it a, a great deal. One thing you can do is you can do try to do what, what China does is you don't necessarily exploit your supply chain. You just say, all right, you go in debt in my currency or whatever, a stable currency like the euro or whatever, uh, that, I, that I, you know, it could be the USD because in that case, uh, China, of course, is a net creditor to the United States. So it, it has a lot of bonds and so on. It, it, it's liquid in that, in that sense, the, the currency transactions. And, and that's ultimately what you're going for, right? Um, and if, if, you know, if you want, you can simply say, I'll, bend, I'll build the infrastructure, it's yours, you just pay me over a certain amount of time in my currency. Well, there's an obvious problem with that, right? Uh, that infrastructure you know, can be taken over. You can be kicked out. That's happened all over the world. The Greeks in Egypt, um, the Indians in many African countries were kicked out. Um, you have, you have, anytime you hear about a, a, a pogrom, a massacre of a minority, it's typically preceded by the taking of property. Uh, because, the, you know, this minority, uh, which now lacks political power uh, because they're a minority uh, or simply a disfavored group, they don't necessarily have to be a minority, right? It's for South Africa in the past. Um, you know, ultimately what, what ends up happening is that you create a situation where the, the trade maybe in some cases also has un unpredictable consequences because it favors certain groups of people. Um, which don't necessarily have connections to the political establishment, not always, right? Once you let in private, private corporations which are linked to banks, it's not always the case that, you know, they, don't, they have a similar agenda as the governments that they represent, which is why you can see why China has been so successful, right? In, in most cases, all these players are on the same, are on the same page. Um, and so that, of course, makes things simpler. Maybe not better, but it makes things simpler. Uh, especially when it comes to negotiation. Now, with the currency issue, um, you know, if if the if you can have a takeover, well, in, in the case of China, that's not you know. In other words, you simply seize the property, uh, United States property in Cuba, another example. Um, what ends up happening is, in that case, well, if you have a big, bigger military, you can just go in and take it back. You know, you can probably stage a coup, um, and that's where political shenanigans get really, 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 really interesting. Um, you know, you've got Iran, Operation Ajax, all these things really deal with protection of private property in order to, in order to create this empire, in order to sustain the empire, which was always global, never local. That may change, data, um, and, you know, digital, digital infrastructure is abstract. You can sort of export it. You can stay in your country, create the software in your country, and then export it through underwater cables um, all over the world. So this may change. Uh, who knows? Um, you know, if, if, if outsourcers can do, if outsourcing is a massive industry. You can just imagine the whole thing taking over the whole world. Um, so you've got that one example where, sure, you know, if you're trying to, if, and you do it that way, um, you know, in other words, you don't try to tie supply chains together directly, um, but, you know, you still run the risk of having your property or this building that you've built taken over uh, in times of political instability or something else, or just dis 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 disaffection. Um, of course, in that case, China is not too worried about that. It's, it's you know, um, or, or you know, it's, it's not that worried about it, right? It's got a bigger military than a lot of, than most of the countries that it that it invests in. 
Uh, and that's, of course, where you see how economics and the military are tied together. Protection and trade are tied together. So that's one way to do it. Uh, you know, but the other way is what the United States is doing now. It's telling, it's giving tax incentives to, say, Taiwan to build in Arizona. So, it's, okay, you've got this next generation uh, fabrication plant. Uh, well, why don't you go ahead and build it instead of in, in Taipei? Uh, come over and build it in Arizona. We'll give you a, you know, I'm sure there's some sort of tax incentive, right? Uh, tax credit, whether it's state, federal, or all the above. And, and then what happens is that you manage that system through video conferences, the typical offshore economy, right? The typical offshore strategy where, you know, you're able to manage investments overseas and co corporate activity overseas by having maybe a couple of managers, um, you know, from Taiwan within the plant in Arizona that then, you know, liaison with, you know, people that are liaisons with people back in, you know, Taiwan rather than having, you know, 90% the other way around, right? 90% of the people there, the employees are Taiwanese. Now the United States is trying to switch that up where it's still try it still works, right? Taiwan still owes the United States money, um, but, you know, it, it's now, in a, it, it has a harder time perhaps creating jobs, but maybe not, right? Maybe now it just shifts to HR. It tries to learn more about the Arizona, uh, you know, it's sort of the, the abstract, uh, you know, the abstract wheels that make corporation run, which is HR, which is law, uh, you know, a lot of other things like productivity. Uh, and maybe it tries to take some of those resources back. And instead of having an HR meeting in person on the fourth floor, maybe you have it through a video conferencing app. So that's another thing we want to look for. That's one, another way you want to try to minimize the dependency of people, of countries over each other. Um, and, so, and again, this all goes back to relationships, right? If you have a situation where, you know, you, you go into a relationship, in many cases, one of the partners, you know, you, you might have a combined bank account, but in many cases, one of the partners will have his or her own bank account, just in case. We don't know. You're still partners, but just in case. So everyone is, has an incentive to try to figure out ways of protecting, protecting themselves from this dependency that's inherent in the concept of an empire. And the empire itself is at, uh, at much less risk because of two things, right? One of the military aspect where they can seize property. Um, and, you know, this happens a lot, as we just talked about. Um, but the other, uh, uh, of course, it's a currency. You know, at the end of the day, right, you're operating on my currency. So you still owe me. So, so a portion of your work comes to me. And I can print as much as I want of my currency. So if, if I owe you some of that money, that's not a big deal. I just, you know, go to my government bank, uh, the Federal Reserve, and I can just print a lot of that stuff, issue that debt. Um, I might have to go through Congress, but, in, in, you know, in, in the case of an emergency, it's not that difficult to get things passed, as we saw in 2008, 2009, and now in 2020. So what's the down? So why not just have smaller countries, you know, you know, have these deals, but in their own currency? Well, banks are basically they're just ad advanced, you know, sort of receptacles for technology. Uh, you look at the blockchain. You look at all these things. These are all methods. You, know, you can't transfer money without going through an, an international system that involves like SWIFT, that, that is inherently global. And so you have mechanisms in place to make sure that you know whoever has the best protection in the digital realm is also the one that controls the money because you don't want to keep, you know, a hundred billion dollars in a Nigerian bank, maybe not today, who knows in the future. But the, you know, you, the question is you have to have all these, you know, digital infrastructures that also, that also allow you to do things like transfer money back, back and forth on a daily basis. What about, there's so many things that happen and I have yet to work in a bank, so I can't tell you specifics, but you can just extrapolate, right? You just, you have to have, you have to be one of the leaders in, in technology um, and digital security in order to uh, have a, a level of comfort in making sure, and of course you have a legal structure around that so that you can't just file a lawsuit and just sort of uh, have a default judgment and then take that property. So all these things are es essentially hallmarks of an advanced society. And, you know, you don't have that everywhere. And so all these things go together. And, you know, by now you might be asking yourself, well, why bother? I mean, just trade amongst yourselves and trade amongst your neighbors and do it in your own currency. I don't have a problem with that. I, I think that makes sense. If you're Africa, you already have a lot of, uh, plenty of consumers, plenty of young people. Uh, you can do that. You have neighbors. You don't have to use the sea. You can use trucks. You have to have infrastructure that can be built fairly simply. Um, and in fact, Africa has basically decided to do that. They built a, a, an economic alliance. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, a lot of the bigger countries are now desperate to get in, both China and the United States. 
Um, and, you know, the Africans were, were very frustrated when uh, the United States uh, negotiated, tried to negotiate um, very low prices for coffee farmers um, in one, one of the uh, Doha trade rounds, uh, one of these international negotiation platforms or meetings for negotiating things like prices and so on. Um, and that may have been the tipping point, uh, that the, who knows, but I do remember the American rep representative being extremely arrogant, you know, saying that, you know, after offering uh, a lot of these African farmers and agriculture is a, is a lightning rod. I mean, most, most people will still work in agriculture over, you know, in most countries, people don't get that. Um, that's why they're a powerful lobby. Um, but of course it also deals with food security. And I still remember the American representative saying that, you know, we showed up here with a can-do attitude, not a can't-do attitude. Oh, God. You know, uh, as somebody with a U.S. passport, it was just an, an embarrassment. It was, it was just a complete embarrassment. And here we are. Uh, the consequences of that short-sightedness are now a movement away from the United States, uh, the empire of the United States. So, of course, downsides, right? If you're the mafia, you offer your protection. Uh, one of the ways you do that is a military base, right? Um, and that, that's creating some issues now where Donald Trump, President Trump, is asking the South Koreans to pay more money in order to have that base there. And that gets really complicated because uh, in Singapore, they didn't at first want the British to leave in the 1960s because the military base was a source of income. You know, people come in, again, it's a currency. People come in, um, they have access to a currency that is stronger because it's more liquid and accepted on the international markets. And so they get to go out and spend that money relative to a currency that isn't, doesn't really have the digital infrastructure or the liquidity in order to, to be able to, de to determine its own strength. And so that's a big source of the economy. If you're able to, of course, also the underground economy, the mafia then builds up, expands and so on. Um, but you can see very clearly that it's not always a take-take situation. It, it really does end up in a position where you have to negotiate. Uh, and this becomes, you know, you don't want to be in a relationship where you're always negotiating things, right? Um, so it can become problematic, but um, you can also see how, it, you know, the terms and conditions are really what dictate how these things work out, how these relationships work out. Um, and whether the empire, and, and, the, and one of the ways that an empire lasts, uh, the longevity of an empire is based on how it handles these negotiations without completely bankrupting itself through overextension um, or just through oppression, which is what the British empire collapsed. Um, you know, a lot of the European empires were sort of riding high on this idea of racial superiority um, and, and it had all these different formats, different names. Um, but, you know, suffice to say, if the only people you see with, with dark skin are slaves because of, a, of, of just that just happened to be the supply chain routes uh, that were established a few hundred years ago, uh, you can see how suddenly even the philosophers and smart people in your country will, seen, will start to see people everywhere with that same skin color as either suitable only for blue collar work um, or simply genetically deficient. Um, this typically, typically happened, by the way, in, in Catholic and Christian uh, societies. It didn't really happen in other, you know, the, I don't recall any Jewish philosopher. I mean, I'm sure that there has to be somebody, right? But for the most part, um, you know, you've got, you know, the, the Catholic Church issuing a papal bull, um, papal bull, which is a papal decree, all the way up to, almost, I think, the 1500s or something, 1450, um, you know, basically allowing the capture of slaves and making it, you know, something that the, the Catholic Church and the Holy See approved of. And you don't really see that, not that late. Uh, you don't see that, uh, that ability to, uh, that, that, to try to project your empire under those terms. You don't really see that in, in places, all, you know, anywhere else in the world. If anything, most places were trying to move away from that sort of, you know, uh, unjust economy. But I'm getting off track. Um, and so a lot of, you can see that a lot of these things, well, first of all, you can see why the European empire um, you know, was so brutal uh, if it was, in fact, based on these sort of ideas of racial superiority um, all the way up the chain, to the, all the way up the, the chain from the lowest levels all the way up to the highest levels of the philosophers and, and so on. But you can also see that movements, social movements like religious movements, you know, oftentimes are political movements. They, there's an overlap. So uh, in the case of the Catholic Church, you have a situation where, you know, it was a pope, Pope Urban II, that ordered the Crusades to take back property and land all the way up into, you know, Vietnam. You know, that, that, that was way back in, I think, the 1100s or, you know, about a thousand years ago. Fast forward 70 years ago, 
uh, Vietnam was something that was supported by the United States because of the Catholic establishment. Joe McCarthy, the uh, you know who, who was famous for his um, sort of communist, anti-communist um, expeditions in Congress, he was a devout Catholic. Um, they helped install the United States helped install a uh, a person of um, a, essentially a dictator within South Vietnam, uh, whose brother was an archbishop. So you know you can see that. In many cases, you know, it's not economics and the military and protection overlap, but there's also a social component that determines the longevity of those relationships because it can't just be a tit-for-tat negotiation. It really should be a situation where you're exchanging ideas and trying to make each other better. And most economists, they sort of forget about all these things. They sort of don't look at that big picture. Uh, but if you're the empire, one of the great things about having a link to some to other places is that you get to steal their best people, the most attractive people, the most athletic people. So you go to the United States today. I, I haven't looked at it, but I'm sure that the that the people who represent the United States in long distance are probably from Kenya or an African country. They probably stolen. And I think Mo Salah. Uh, wait, sorry, that's a soccer player. I believe there might be another uh, runner with a similar name. Um, but, you know, you can see, in, in fact, most of the lot plays for a British club, right? I mean, so, I mean, he's Egyptian. Uh, so you can see that, that, you can see how that works, right? You kind of steal, and in doing so, you give yourself a 200% advantage, right? Because if you're Egyptian, Egypt, um, you know, you, you've essentially lost your best player. Um, and so you've lost that best player because, you know, you don't have a digital infrastructure that allows you to control that social media, that allows you to profit off of that advertising structure, infrastructure, which is all digital now. Um, you don't control the media channels, so you can't get that, you can't create demand for consumer demand. And so your economy is, is inherently limited because somebody else is getting, gaining the profits on those jersey sales, uh, not you, even though you're the one that made that person. So you lose that person, you've invested in that person, and that person now goes someplace else, and you've lost that. You know, the other person gains is 100% up, uh, goes up 100% because any profits that are made, are, you know, they didn't do anything to gain those profits. Uh, whereas the country like Egypt, once they lose that person, they're now minus, they've lost a whole person. That's minus 100%. That's a 200% gap, if you look at it. Uh, and, and if you keep doing that enough times, eventually it's very hard to succeed if you're that country that's dealing with the empire. And that's, you can see how that, why so many countries make it more difficult for people to leave. Um, you know, whether it's doctors in Cuba, you know, or, or whatnot in the past. Um, you can see why you have these sorts of scenarios uh, coming up. And all this stuff makes sense when you think about it in the overall paradigm. And so, and, and especially if the paradigm is based on empires as mafia. Uh, because you can also see that, you know, surveillance, right? Well, what happens? When I, when I have to protect you, I have to invest in things like protection that, that, are, that help me protect you. Like drones, surveillance. Uh, if I don't do that, then I lose credibility. So look at the economy. It's a trickle-down economy, just like President Bush, the first one, talked about. Um, that's why he used the words trickle-down economy. What he was trying to say is that the investments made at the military uh, level uh, that are used to protect allies overseas in order to extract wealth from them um, and by making the U.S. dollar more liquid and a medium of trade, an accepted medium of trade worldwide, that allows us to be stronger and it and also allows us to steal a lot of ideas, either by licensing or just outright theft, uh, invasion, and so on. Uh, you know, create a, a new country called Kuwait, um, or you start dividing uh, little kingdoms, um, you know, and so on. That, that, that's basically something that makes you stronger because now you can negotiate, uh, you know, a lot easier with a small country called Kuwait than, uh, you know, say, an empire that takes over you know, with its capital, capital as Mesopotamia, it takes over a lot long, you know, a lot larger geography, um, and so you can see why you have a lot of small states um, that uh, are either functioning as offshore tax shelters or, like Kuwait, that are you know that have a lot of oil. It's something to be essentially exported, and the offshore element of this is, should not be ignored. Uh, you know, the, one of the problems with all this is that as you're trying to create this empire, is you got to figure out what countries are good for what. Well, if you're Ireland. What do you have to offer, really? I mean, you know, of course, I think you know, I, I happen to be shocked and amazed at the talent coming out of that country. It's such a small island and the talent 
literary talent that continues to come out all the way from Dylan Thomas up here. I mean, it's, it's, it's to Rosen Kelly. Uh, it's unbelievable. I, I don't understand how it works. I mean, to have that, you know, it's, 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 it's incredible. And I've never been there and I hope to go visit Quark and Galloway and so on. But um, the fact of the matter is that the, you can't really build an economy on poetry. And so, you know, that, that, that it's, it's, a great, it's, it's a good resistance movement, as Václav Havel would tell you, the playwright and the politician, but um, the fact of the matter is you need something more. And so well, that's how you have a lot of these offshore tax shelters, whether it's San Marino, a lot of these tiny countries. Go back and look them up. I'm, I'm not sure about Luxembourg's status, but you've got all these little islands everywhere in the world, um, many of which you've probably never heard of. But Ireland, of course, is one of the, one of the most famous tax shelters uh, because you can have a system where now you're the empire and they've got a problem because you are in a position where by having these alliances, by exporting even things like your, your, your now your accounting code has to ac account for international transactions. And maybe it doesn't know how to do that very well because it's being represented and drafted by a government that's almost purely domestic, that knows everything about the country, but not really about what's happening outside the country because it's, it's just not how politicians typically work. Non-diplomats, right? I'm talking about legislators. They draft laws with, with an expertise in what happens in their district, not overseas. So you can see how there's a lot of opportunity for corporations to game the system within an empire and why you have corporate uh, power rising so rapidly uh, in empires, because the, again, the whole idea of an empire is, is to expand and project that power through globalization. And so if you have, you can have a situation where a country, uh, a company, we'll, we'll call it just randomly, you know, hypothetically Kaiser, you know, Pfizer, uh, well, whatever. Um, <laughs> so you, you have a situation where a company like that could in fact uh, have a subsidiary a, uh, overseas in Ireland, uh, probably, um, and then, you know, pay no taxes for 10 years simply because it's, it's putting all of its intellectual property, this abstract digital, you know, non, sorry, not digital, non-tangible items overseas. It's, it's selling that and, and letting that grow in value um, overseas. And then it's actually buying uh, from a manufacturing plant located in Cork. I don't know where it is, right? Somewhere. And it's actually buying that back. So it's actually spending money. So it's showing a loss every time it buys products, pharmaceuticals to be shipped into the United States and then distributed it. So that's how it ends up paying. That's just one possible way. It's a simple way. There are so many other ones. I swear to God, there's one tax scheme called Double Dutch. Yeah, where is it? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Double Irish with a Dutch sandwich. I swear to God, that's the official name. Uh, but, you know, so a lot of people want to blame corporations um, instead of blaming politicians that are the ones drafting the laws. Because I keep trying to tell people, Amazon and all these comp companies that... Uh, you know, they're, not, they're not the ones that draft European tax laws, right? They're not the ones doing that. And somehow, you know, we don't try to put more pressure on our politicians to try to resolve this. Because in order to do, to do that, first of all, you have to have good politicians, right? As smart ones that understand these things. And how many politicians are tax lawyers? Very few. A lot of them are lawyers, just not tax lawyers. Um, and certainly very few CEOs, former CEOs. So uh, you can see right away that in a globalized structure, uh, the shenanigans, the opportunity for shenanigans is, is, is very, very readily available. So that creates problems, and that's maybe one of the reasons why empires fail, because corporations are, are within this globalized structure tend to take over. This happened in, in, in the British Empire, right? The British East India Company at one point had a military that was bigger than the official government military under the Queen. Uh, of course, the queen is the one that gives you this, the seal of, of, of approval right, to, to operate in foreign countries. But the British East India Company was, was actually collecting taxes over in Bengal, in India. Uh, I mean, these places can become city-states. That's expensive. British Empire showed that. You don't want to occupy anybody else. It, it saps your own morale. It saps your own standing, which is why I'm really confused about this whole whatever is going on now with India and Kashmir. Uh, but in any case, um, going too far off topic there. Uh, so you, what you really want to do is doing what the United States is trying to do now, which is to try to not only use finance and these abstract methods of domination, of inf sorry, influence, right? A more polite term. Um, and so you want to do it that way. And now it's software. Uh, so maybe this Taiwanese situation where it might be a model that people use in the future. Um, how that's going to work out, I don't know. Again, it goes back to relationships um, and, you know, how those negotiations take place. 
but you can see that as people close their borders, uh, not only to keep their own talent from leaving, I'm not sure that's going to work out very well. Um, but you can see how so much of this is, you know, so much of this, these different economic relationships, you know, go back into what we see today, the way how our lives are dealt with, even the grid system in most cities in America is a product of, um, you know, trying to control the population uh, because it's easier to, you know, if, if we have a crowd, we want crowd control, well, that's much more difficult in Europe. That's one of the reasons the strikes in Europe are so much more effective. You can't cut them off, you know, at a, a grid allows you to cut off a, a protest very quickly. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, very straightforward, right? You have to go down one path. You can't go in a roundabout and go through four different paths. Um, and, you know... <laughs> So everything you see is, is, is a, goes back to this trickle-down economy that is based on, on empire status. So how that's going to work out for the, for the U.S. now that it's trying to move away from its, its empire status and trying to do uh, a totally new way of doing things, right, which is digital, abstract, you know, um, con attempts at control, uh, not just financially but now technologically, uh, you know, which is going to be an extension of the offshore business model. Um, which, of course, is going to need massive tax reform. So I really don't know how this is going to work out. Um, uh, so, but, you know, it, it, it's all, but I hope I've made it a little bit simpler. Uh, you have a trickle-down economy that then, you know, explains why we have so much surveillance, the drones that, that may one day be used to ship products to you, uh, or the robots and so on. A lot of that, again, comes from the need for security overseas, that and those investments then trickle down. By the way, th those investments happen because you can you can force the other side to pay for it through the maintenance of the military base overseas, uh, and so you can channel those investments through um, those products through the military base, and then use that as a as an example of what protection that is being provided. Which of course, you know, is is, is interesting, right? Because now you've got to overhaul the military to the extent that you've got drones that can do the work now of ten soldiers in the past. Well, probably more. Um, and, and what do you do with all these, all these different um, you know, fighter jets that are, that are now potentially obsolete because they're not as effective as this asymmetrical warfare that can be waged by a much smaller cost-effective drone? Um, in other words, you know, in the past, you had to, if you wanted to bomb the Saudi pipelines somewhere or, you know, or the Chinese infrastructure uh, oil pipeline somewhere, you have to have a, you know, a detectable jet that goes around and tries, or you have to at least infiltrate somebody else's foreign military. With a drone, I mean, especially if, if some, I'm sure they've already, they've already figured out a way to make a stealth drone. Um, how, how does all that work? Um, how, how do you, you've got a whole system of, of where that, in, that includes asymmetrical behavior at its core, which is what technology does. It makes things smaller and more cost effective. Um, and so how do you, how do you manage all these things unless you also reform all these other layers that are interlinked within this trickle down economy? Um, and you know, like for example, the tax code, which is a big one. Um, and of course the immigration code, which hasn't really been fixed in quite some time. Uh, so you can see how a lot of this, a lot of the things we see, the grid system in cities, uh, why we have so many, um, you know, why we have so much, so much of our technology that is, that's based on surveillance. CCTVs everywhere and so on. All that is a trickle-down system, uh, an economic system in part, uh, that is really based on the concept of the empire as mafia. Um, and so how do you, so that's, that's what we're living under. Uh, at least it makes sense, I hope, a little bit more sense why things are the way they are. Uh, the advertising and making enemies, trying to make your enemies look bad. Um, so you can take more of their territory or more of the land, um, or at least try to put sanctions on them, right? It's the same thing as having these sort of family disputes where you try to restrict co competition through agreements. You know, you, you, tra you, you trade over there, you sell your drugs over there, or sell mine over here. Uh, and then amidst all this, you have a tax code that allows you to ship, open up a manufacturing plant over there and then have, the, have, the, have them ship you drugs and then get a tax deduction. The whole thing is clearly too complex. Uh, although it's, it's not as complex, I hope I've made it less complex, but uh, in the end, there has to be a change and it has to work. The changes have to be on multiple fronts. My fear right now is that the changes are not being done on multiple fronts. Uh, and so we're just gonna end up in the same situation in the past. Uh, and so hopefully we can try to come up with something that allows us to understand these things and therefore try to fix them. Um, and at least the first thing, I would definitely focus on the tax code. 
Um, and if you try to fix that, then the question is, how do you project power? What are different ways of projecting power besides, you know, currency and, you know, protection? If we figure that out, maybe we've got a chance at moving away from a trickle-down economy um, that, is, that, that has at its foundation military spending.